food. It is as essential as air is to breathe and water is to drink. Food is life. But where does our food come from? The Bahamas has more than 2,000 farmers, but it's hardly enough to keep up with our growing population. Or is it? We travel the nation to find out the answers to the questions everyone is asking. Can we grow enough fruit and vegetables? Can we raise enough sheep, goat, and chickens? Can we catch enough fish to feed a country with almost 400,000 people? Keep watching as we find out from the people who make it happen. Can we feed ourselves? This is Grand Bahama, just 55 miles off the coast of West Palm Beach, Florida. Grand Bahama is one of the most unique islands in the Bahamas, starting with its name. Originally called Bahama by the Lucayan people, it was called Great Shallows by the Spanish. The English translation, Grand Bahama. Grand Bahama saw sporadic habitation in the early days since discovery. The island became the second option for pirates, fleeing the authority of royal governors in New Providence. During the American Civil War, Grand Bahama saw activity from blockade runners seeking to take provisions to the southern states. During slavery, Grand Bahama saw moderate farming activity. Life on the islands focused more around the sea. During the Prohibition era, Grand Bahama was a key transshipment point for bootleggers. Those booms were short-lived. Grand Bahama was largely untouched until the early 1950s when Wallace Groves, an American investor, had a vision that would become the city of Freeport. The vision for Freeport was carried forward by a pair of Brits, Edward St. George and Sir Jack Hayward. Grand Bahama is the industrial capital of the Bahamas, playing home to a number of oil refinery and storage operations. It's also home to one of the largest shipyards and container ports in the region and a number of other industrial operations. Grand Bahama is also the number two tourism destination in the Bahamas. Farming has come and gone on Grand Bahama with the undeniable potential remaining. At one time, Grand Bahama was a major supplier of citrus and poultry in the Bahamas. These days, Grand Bahama is known more for its export of music and sporting stars. Her farmers hope to change that and return the farming magic that has since faded. If you drive far enough in the eastern part of Grand Bahama, you'll find side roads that dart off into long expanses of pine forests. One of these roads lead you here, to the Bahamas Golden Harvest Farm. Once a citrus grove, the farm has been transformed into something different. The sounds of chickens roosting equals the sound of money for this farmer. He's harvesting eggs. Uh, this, this they say that my eggs in the back there, but I just have these couple. This was a little experiment I was doing. These some chickens that I hatched. Them. Edney Sherman isn't really sure he's retired yet. While running this farm in East Grand Bahama is his full-time job, and he's done enough research to understand the profitability of a successful organic egg operation, he has other reasons. I mean, I like it a lot, and so it ain't all about the the financial aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that can have to play a part for it to be sustainable. Right. But for now, I really like it. It's therapeutic. And I enjoy it, and I could see potential in it. Mm -hmm. it. Needs to expand a bit. If you were to add up all of the poultry being produced in the Bahamas by Bahamian producers it is less than 30 percent of all the poultry we consume so that there is a huge 
economic opportunity for persons who are interested in poultry production. On the meat side, and even more so in terms of eggs. That opportunity is exactly what Sherman is banking on. His original hen house was much larger than what he has now, but he's expanding again to ensure that he's ready for the demand that is building as Bahamans turn more and more to eating locally raised organic eggs. The Bahamas can definitely uh, reduce the, the, uh, the need for foreign imports in feeding ourselves. And the start that we need is for us to be serious about it in every aspect. The farmers need to be a little bit more serious about it. The policy makers should be a bit more serious and more committed to it. And then the Bahamian uh, consumer, the customers need to be con uh, serious about it. The, even if the, the farmers produce a quality product at a reasonable price and quantity, and it's not purchased by the Bahamian consumers, the Bahamas still tend, I mean, the, the farmers still tend to lose and cannot sustain the production of their product. Uh, it, it has to be a buy-in from all of the aspects that we depend on to make it work. But in the short answer to it is yes, the Bahamas could do a lot better than we're doing. And we could approach probably a 50% mark in uh, producing uh, the foods that we could produce here and, and reduce our imports. Once, once that happens, and I think the local people see the potential in the, uh, the local grown products, then it will, I think it will take off like wildfire and then more people will become interested in it and then more people would support it. Sherman says that for all the trying, there remains the issue of Bahamian customers not fully appreciating why buying Bahamian is critical to our overall national economic growth. The investment needed to raise enough chickens to produce eggs that are of a high quality is no small amount. He says it's a simple matter of needing money to make money. And for most small farmers, the financial risk is too much to keep the farms going. But as it is now, it's almost a hit and miss kind of approach that we take. And it's very, very discouraging when you have exhausted your funding. You have not penetrated the market sufficiently enough to become uh, financially uh, sufficient or self-sufficient uh, financially and then it's just a just a matter of time before you have to shut down. I think that happens with a lot of the local farmers. We had just come through an independent celebration and one of the things that's clear, Bahamians are very patriotic. However, there is an additional area we need to be patriotic in and that is buying from each other. Let's empower each other. Spending a little bit more with Bahamians will pay dividends for all of us in the long run. You may save a bit today shopping foreign, but in the long run, all of us are going to lose. But if we look at it uh, holistically, I think it's an approach that we can definitely make uh, very, very good inroads to feeding ourselves in the not too distant future. Sherman remains an optimist, hence his investment in expanding his operations. He hopes to have at least 1,000 egg-laying hens in the near future, and maybe even triple that amount by the time his building is completed. He says the future of Grand Bahama farming is entirely in the hands of Grand Bahamians. Johnson on the Old Freetown Farm. Um, Old Freetown Farm is a, is a farm where we, we gear towards agritourism. Um, we try to, 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 to make something that's sustainable and being able to, to create something that's uh, transparent where locals and tourists can, could come and visit our farm and see exactly what, you know, the way how we do things here on Grand Bahama. Uh, what we try to grow mostly is uh, crops that recover faster after hurricanes. They, even though they destroy easier, they, they recover faster because um, uh, once they once they've cut um, broken down through winds, you can cut them and plant them over, and within a year you can you can have crops. Sugarcane, bananas, papayas is what we focus on. Uh, selling the sugarcane as it is, and also processing it for juice. 
um, doing a, a food, a tasting um, right on the farm, like farm to table. People can taste uh, the papayas right here and the bananas and also taking our produce out to the public at uh, farmers market is what we get at doing. Um, schools and tourists could come and visit to see our animals. Uh, that's the petting farm side of it. We have a variety of animals on the farm. Chickens, goats, pigs, turkeys, peacocks, and we also have a few donkeys. George Johnson is in the middle of a shift on the farm that he runs with his family. Despite having a wide variety of animals on the grounds of the old Freetown farm, the farm looks and operates more like a petting zoo, in part because that's what it is, at least for the moment. Johnson plans to get deep into raising livestock as soon as he can find a formula for feeding his animals. Until then, he's experimenting with more crops. He says Bahamian farmers could do a lot better with a more narrower focus. Each farmer has to probably pick a crop that they can grow. Um, we, should, we can't do all the same things because we realize that in the, in the event that there's a storm and everybody has the same crop, then we don't have anything else to feed, feed the nation. So what we need to do is every farmer needs to find what can grow well on their property, on their land, mm -hmm. and being able to grow enough for their area. And we don't need to go to the point where we, it's bigger than what we can handle. Johnson's farm has had to overcome a number of blows dealt by the hurricane season of the last few years. He says Bahamian farmers are in need of the government's assistance now more than ever. And he has some ideas on how that can happen. We have to seek out those farmers that, that are serious and, um, and, and want to invest their time into it. And government can go as far as uh, creating some type of subsidiary for, for these farm, farmers. Um, once they realize that farmers are, are willing to grow on a commercial level, not, not so much uh, those farms that we consider as backyard farming. And once they realize that we, will, we have the land and we want to grow it on that level, the government could uh, subsidize in those areas. Until then, Johnson will continue to plan his crops while at the same time transitioning his farm for the future. He says he believes Grand Bahama's best days in farming are right around the corner but there are some hurdles to overcome. He's not alone in that view. The biggest challenge I feel Grand Bahamian farmers face would be consistency. So a lot of the farmers we have, these are guys that are willing, they have the wherewithal, but every now and again we have those things called hurricanes. And even if you're off to a good start, sometimes that's derailed. And it's difficult for them to come back year in and year out and develop a product that can be sold in grocery stores or convenience stores, so I would say consistency is our big thing in Grand Bahama. We're excited to have a solid technical staff in Grand Bahama. In addition, we have access to expertise from throughout the Bahamas, and by way of the government, we have access to expertise internationally. And so we're encouraging farmers to improve their, their method of farming, uh, to be far more efficient in how they use the scarce resources that they have and the ministry through its extension services are prepared to work with them. In addition, there's a tremendous amount of information so they must, uh, each of uh, the farmers must also invest in their own education to make sure that they build their capacity and whether that, that means going online and doing research, whether that means contacting the office in Grand Bahama or in New Providence, they must continually improve their knowledge of the particular area that they're focused on. We stand ready to assist. The potential for agricultural growth in Grand Bahama is quite significant. One of the concepts that have began to take root is the idea of communal farming, using plots of land that can be shared between a number of families to produce the items that they have particular interest in. The second um, focus will be on whom farms or some persons refer to it as backyard farming. 
there is a notion that every family ought to have some fruit trees in their yard but now you can extend that to include uh, vegetables as well you get to determine the amount of herbicides if any pesticides if any that you're prepared to use an organic farming is not only a healthy way to go it makes sense uh, because it can also generate revenue for those families who may wish to form cottage industries to market the products that they are growing organically. In the settlement of hunters in central Grand Bahama, you'd expect to find a lot of things in the middle of town. A farm isn't one of them. MP for Central Grand Bahama, which covers the area, Iram Lewis is hoping to change that. Along with Anthony Hudson, a resident from the more well-off side of town, the people of Hunters will have their very own community garden. Lewis says it's a dream long in the making. Um, we've already sourced our composting. Um, we have, we have our seeds. Um, our, our, our nursery is already um, on the way where our seedlings are now in bed and, and, and they're, they're being um, uh, nurtured. So when we get to the point where we can transplant them, we'll transplant them down here. And of course, this will be the kickstart of, of, of the major, not only backyard farming, but the community farming. So um, we expect good things to happen in short order. The seedlings are being readied in Hudson's backyard in planter boxes he built. When ready, they'll be moved to a small patch of land just in front of the community center and nurtured by residents of the area. Lewis is hoping this small community farm will have a big impact on not only the closeness of his area, but also the health of the residents. So again, what you're seeing right now, we're gonna borrow it. It's a raw stable thing, he just said. We'll be killing it in a few days. And once, once it's still ready, you can do the pitch. So it's still ready, what's the next step? Bring the compost in. And then we start preparing it. And it means it's covered by the steps and so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, we are presently putting up um, our fences. We will have a contained area where we're going to grow um, uh, herbs. We have cabbages, um, lettuce, tomatoes, bell peppers, um, spices, um, thyme, etc in this area and we're also going to fence in the second area so that when you come into the center you, you will see um, the garden area which will make backyard farming and community farming more visible. Um, we also have an initiative where we are, will have quarterly farmers market so the produce that we grow right here we'll be harvesting them and we'll be selling them in the community um, to, to make sure that the program is sustainable. For the former Olympian the project is also about empowerment through nutrition. It's a very important part of the Ministry of Agriculture initiative to feed ourselves, the Feed Ourselves program, and, and we believe that this would be, go a long way um, in terms of mobilizing that program and, 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 and getting people to understand the importance. And you know, once people see things, they'll, they'll buy into it more easily. Imagine for a moment, you're eating healthy foods, but you also have the uh, opportunity to sell the excess that you and your family do not need in order to generate badly needed revenue. Turning an interest in raising animals into revenue is exactly what motivated this resident of Lewis Yard, Michael Grant, to get into farming. It happened almost by accident. It was a trip to Long Island on a construction job a few years ago that pushed him to try his hand at becoming a goat farmer. A friend on Long Island sent him a couple of animals and the rest was history. Michael also started to raise chickens and had a customer for his mutton and his eggs right across the street, his mother's restaurant. What did you tell him to the woman? To the, to the, I mean, when we buy them for the restaurant plus there, and then people just come every frequently and buy them. Right. Some guy just tell me this morning you gotta come for your organic egg. He tired of buying egg with the shop. So I just tell him come and once he keep coming, the old man wait for them, so. You know? How do you sell it, doesn't you? You, you have an egg. What's it cost him? 
Daddy really is pricey, so I don't really need it. I mean, he, he, I think he usually sell it like four, four something for a creep. Something like that, yeah. Lewis is excited about the idea that a young Grand Bahamian can see potential in farming. He is worried, however, that the business side of things may get left behind and is working hard to fix that. The whole thing is about feeding ourselves. So instead of, of importing farmers to show us how to do it, if we have young men with the interest, we should encourage them and see how we can help them along the way to make sure that they, they don't only see the scientific side, but also the business side of it, you know, thereby we can feed ourselves and do it, do it the right way, in a big way. When I first started, it, it was like, more like a, uh, yeah, but as I go in there, we, we just started to sell the eggs and stuff, so we what do we want to do is we just make it bigger, and we just start using them really with the restaurant and stuff to see the eggs and stuff. But I mean, I try to love the goat stand now so I can maintain it better, because they, they eat everything. Lewis says he will use his role as a parliamentarian to help young Grand Bahamans like Grant reach their full farming potential. Until then, Michael plans to learn as much as he goes, one goat at a time. Despite its well-earned reputation as the industrial hub of the Bahamas, there is no denying the fact that on Grand Bahama, some of the freshest seafood can be found. Every day, thousands of pounds of the freshest snappers, groupers, and a wide variety of sea life can be found just minutes away from the hustle and bustle of Metro Freeport. Here, fish is expertly cleaned for walk-up buyers or prepped before heading into the kitchen for quick preparation. This is out to sea, just off the East Sunrise Highway in Freeport. Operated by Emilike Functon, out to sea is a simple concept. You want seafood? Come here. For Bahamians who love fresh seafood, out to sea is a gold mine. With, with most Bahamians, you know, obviously our prize always are snappers. Everybody knows the snappers, the, red, the lane snappers, yellow tails, these local easy catch fishermen go out in shallow waters, small boats that go and able to attain us. But we do have a, quite a bit. You know, we have, we have from pelagic fish, from tuna, dolphin. We even have swordfish in the Bahamas, which is awesome tasting. Um, you know, so you know, these things are that we actually have shrimp in the Bahamas in, in great depths, but I don't even know many people harvesting them. Most people doing shrimp farms, but if you go, if you're a fisherman, you go over there in some of these depths for the, for the good red snappers, the deep water fish, you'd find that most of them, they're, they're ingesting quite some large shrimp, good quality large shrimp. So it must be here available in abundance in the Bahamas. Like I said, we, 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 one thing we are blessed with here is our land, sun, and sea. And people from all over the world, I don't care what walks it is, we always prize for our waters and what our waters have to offer. And it's important for us, I think, to be able to sit here and, and, and protect, protect and maintain, preserve what we help. Even if it means us as local people, local fishermen, having to pay a price to help and maintain this thing is, is important for us to do that. Foreigners come from all over the world and they sit there and they enjoy it. And they, they, some of them abuse it. But we here, we need to understand and appreciate we are. And this is something God gave us, our land, sand and sea. The Out to Sea concept was built around the idea that in a country made up of 700 islands and keys and some of the best water in the world, there should be no reason not to have the best seafood available, even if it's in the middle of town. But Fountain took it one step further, creating a compound that's home to a couple of smaller mini restaurants with a conch stall and a jerk pit just a few feet apart from the main flagship sit-down restaurant. Only way you could get that is here at Freeport at Ode to Sea. The uh -huh. only place. What's that again? Seafood macaroni consists of conch and lobster in it. The only place you could get that is at Oak the Sea, at the Key Barbecue Pit. No signature by me. <laughs> it's a major investment for a young Bahamian, employing dozens more in the process. For Fountain, protecting our marine resources is a must. Well, the biggest challenge right now, I think, is sometimes, in, in some respects, we probably are our own challenge. You know, we have a lot of us fishermen who, who still 
go there and, and they, they go against it. Undersized lobster, out of season lobster, undersized count. You know, even even some of the size of the snappers, it may not be a size in your know, regulation of snappers, but your own conscience can tell you, you don't pull a baby snapper, these ones here, you know, still, they still have the breed. And until we respect our own waters and respect what we have right there, you know I mean, there's only so much of the last. You can't abuse it, I mean, you know, and, and some regulations need to be put in place. Aside from that, we have, we have, we have quite a bit of foreignness that some of we local people sit there and indulge and encourage. They come in and they abuse, abuse our waters. I bet you can't go in the States and go there and fish for something without a permit or a license, and they restricted the amounts again. So here we are in a smaller country, limited to less, and then why, why should we not protect and preserve our islands in the same manner and fashion? It is important that we protect the future stock by making sure we give each of these species an opportunity to breed, to grow, and to reproduce. And so we're encouraging you, despite all of the financial challenges you may face, to be wise in the methods you use to fish, and of course, to abide by the law. Fish only within the season. And then of course, if you're aware of persons, Bahamians or foreigners, who are violating the law to report them. At the rate we're going now, if you don't really put a hammer on this, and the size conch and down the size crawfish, we could have some problems down the road, I think. That's the untold side to Grand Bahama's marine life story. Where there is abundance, there's also abuse. For Marine Inspector Clement Campbell, drastic measures are long overdue. I just want to see the lobster off the menu for four months. That's always my cry. Because if you come out here, or go there in June and July. Two, three hundred pound of lobster is a joke. Everybody got lobster in the restaurant. Oh, how long you had it? I had this one before the season closed. Do I look like what? What? And you can go all over the Bahamas and you get the same story. I had this lobster in my freezer from the cell before the season closed. This is July you're talking about now. Season closed from March. Out-of-season harvesting of marine resources is a big problem on Grand Bahama. Fountain has a major issue with restaurants supporting fishermen who practice the habit. While out to sea occasionally buys from small fishermen, they have their own fishing operation for this same reason. If it's out of season, it's not on the menu. I am a local, I fish pleasure, commercial, you know, and, I, and I'm an advocate of it. I, I'd be more than willing to do it because in the long run it benefits us all. So government needs to put some names in place. They need to put more string, stringent uh, laws or fines and even, and even fees for foreigners that fish in our waters. You know, a lot of foreigners here, these bag limits, they, not, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't enforce them the way they should. And, and you go on YouTube or you go on any things, you see these guys coming away with, with, with 10 times their bag limit without any type of recourse or repercussion, you know, and, and, and again, you know, the way that they, they promote it, they promote it as Bahamas just being some almost like a third world country where you just take a boat over from the U.S., come over here, take what you want to go by. No, set an example out of something. Let them know that we, we respect and we appreciate our resources just as much as you do, yeah, man? Like I said, we, we're a small country. We've been blessed, and the only way for this to continue to be maintained, we must protect and maintain it. You know, man, and all the industry need to put their part in and look at it and say, hey, you know, man, I don't, I don't mind doing my part, whether it's in a financial or, or whatever it is, we all need to play a part in this world. Fountain says Grand Bahama fishermen have to end the hypocrisy of railing against foreign poaching when they're busy poaching themselves. He says while our waters are bountiful, there's no telling how long that will last. For the people who depend on him for a paycheck, he's hoping it lasts long into the future. On 12 lush acres of tropical beauty sits the world-famous Garden of the Groves, Grand Bahama's premier nature experience. Originally opened in 1973, the garden is home to a number of species of plant and flowers attracting migratory birds to the park. 
But if you go deeper into the garden, you'll find birds aren't the only things attracted to the park. At the rear of the Garden of the Groves sits the aquaponics farm founded by Wayne Hall in 2009. After 20 years as a successful information technology consultant, Hall traded in his lucrative career in computers to become a farmer. But not just any kind of farmer. Years of research, trial and error convinced Wayne that aquaponics was the way to go. Hall's faith played a big part in his transition from tech to farming. He says it's also the reason his investment has stood nature's tests. Um, obviously we've been through two hurricanes, so this structure you see here actually survived the hurricane. This survived a category four, four hurricane. So that should tell you something there about the ability of putting up the correct structure so that it will work. I mean, after Hurricane Matthew, and you know, uh, typically with a hurricane, most traditional farmers literally lose an entire growing season. But we were actually able to harvest eight weeks after the hurricane. That says something about that right there. And so we grow, and this one in particular, it's just mostly lettuce. It's only lettuce that we have in here. And because that's what the market demand is for at the moment. But what we can produce in the aquaponics, and I've been doing this nine years, what we can produce, um, it represents about 900 million in what we consume annually. So besides the lettuce, I mean, it will grow um, strawberries, culinary herbs, root vegetables. So it all depends on the variety. But obviously the key for us was what the market demand was for here in Grand Bahama. Hall spent a lot of time on similar farms in Abaco and New Providence before committing to his operations here on Grand Bahama. He needed an operation that would be efficient and productive on a small footprint while at the same time being environmentally conscious. He's found that using fish poop to grow some of the best tasting produce in the country. This is all organic, so no pesticides, no chemicals, and so even if the entire system collapsed and all the water came out, it wouldn't affect our groundwater at all because there's nothing in the water. Um, and of course, how it operates is you see the fish tank over here, the, we have a red clapping that we use for the nutrient base. And the fish byproduct, the fish waste, creates the nutrients for the plants. The plants in turn act as a filter, clean the water, and the water circulates back into the fish tank. So in terms of traditional agriculture, this uses less than 2% of the water of regular agriculture. So it is very um, energy conservative, it is very water conservative. So this is, this is basically uh, climate smart agriculture. Paul is paying it forward, teaching what he knows to Tomiko Sawyer. Sawyer studied aquaponics at Bamsey. This runs to our pump over there. What this does is just put oxygen in the water because uh, without it, if the water would become deoxygenated and the plants wouldn't be able to respire correctly and grow correctly without oxygen in the water. The farm's raceways are in a constant state of production, churning out romaine, butter, bib and red leaf lettuce, as well as herbs such as rosemary, arugula and basil every few weeks. He's even growing strawberries in the system. He says the response from the public has been phenomenal. And we can't keep up with the demand. We actually have, um, we, don't have we, we don't have enough space to grow everything we want. Mm -hmm. Only because, well, you know, I mean, with any sort of agricultural endeavor, it requires a capital investment. And of course, two hurricanes, you know, it's taken us a little longer to get where we wanted to be, but we're getting there. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, you see, we have some of the boards up, and so the, the plants float in the water. And when you pull a plant out, and, and you pull one right here, actually, that's what the roots look like when they hang down. They're nice and clean. So, I mean, they're absolutely gorgeous. While Hall doesn't stray too far from the reality that he's running a business, he says his devotion to being a steward of the environment drives him in his approach to farming. He knows that the biggest environmental assaults come, ironically, from farms. 
when we plant things in the ground, we have to add, well, first of all, we have to dig up the rock, pulverize the rock, then add nutrients into the soil. So, and of course, all of our water comes out of the ground. So when we do that, what we're doing is we're literally poisoning ourselves. Because as much as we want to get it to grow, because we put all those chemicals on the soil in order to get the plants to grow, every time it rains or every time we water the plants, the, all those chemicals go back into the, to the water, which we then pump out to drink. So I, wanted to, I really wanted to do something that wasn't going to kill us in the process of trying to grow food. Paul is a true believer of the idea of paying it forward. His reward has been the ability to double the size of his farm. He's also lined up to build a similar farm for the Royal Bahamas Defense Force on Inagua. He says too many farmers are missing out on the idea of pooling their resources to become more successful. You know, you would have several uh, farmers that are doing this type of farming. They will supply the local community. And then in terms of uh, smaller islands, well, they'll feed their own communities and any excess will come back. And so we'll operate as a cooperative. So the cooperative would take all the stuff, buy it out and redistribute it where it needs to go. So because, you know, I mean, when you're farming, a lot of farmers have a passion for farming, but they don't understand business. They don't understand marketing and they don't understand how to package things correctly. But if we actually are able to help them so if you have a farmer that is passionate about farming, well, what we do is they say, all right, we'll set you up one. We'll, we'll teach you how the steps involved. One, two, three, this is what you gotta do. And when you get to the end of the line, we'll take it all back from you. We will package it up. We will put it in, put it in a nice little package and we'll distribute it wherever it needs to go. And everybody gets top dollar for their product because it's all organic, um, premium produce. And the, um, the cooperative will then, uh, whatever, excess because the cooperative will operate in for the benefit of every member and any excess the cooperative makes will then go back to the farmers who contribute. So even if the cooperative makes a profit, those profits will still go back to the people who contribute into, into the cooperative. A farmer is just that, a farmer. But to be profitable in farming, you have to have some sort of business acumen, which a lot of the farmers lack in terms of salesmanship, marketing, building relationships with the grocery stores or whatever have you so that if the Department of Agriculture can facilitate that I feel that we'll be a lot closer to the idea of food security on the island. Drive up the Grand Bahama Highway far enough and you will find the farm and homestead of Alpha Celestine. Papayas and bananas are among the crops grown here but Celestine is in the middle of a transition himself. He's moving one field of bananas and plantains from one section of his farm to another. It's a decision that came after the passage of Hurricane Matthew and Irma. He says he's worried about other farmers who are struggling. The farmers, some of them, they are in need of a, a little training. Uh, if there is field officers that can get out and give them a little training to help them, right, and also uh, can subsidize them as well. They would like a little subsidy because I don't believe they could really take it on right now, on their own. I don't think so. Originally from St. Lucia, Celestine now calls the Bahamas home. His decades of farming throughout the region has left him with the conclusion that the opportunity for farms in the Bahamas is tremendous, and he plans to cash in with his bananas and plantains but he's also banking on another interest that's buzzing around his farm, bees. There is a lot we can do in beekeeping, uh, such as um, feeding for the bees and everything. We have, there's, there's great potentials in that as well, right? We can do, and yet we could do far better than the other Caribbean islands because we have much more in the Bahamas where the bees, the bees could feed than the other Caribbean islands as well. These are the young men and women who participated in a special program for young apiarists. The program was a partnership between the Office of the Prime Minister on Grand Bahama Bahamas Development Bank and the Department of Cooperatives. 
These young Grand Bahamians are in the honey business thanks to the training they got from the government. All right, so what we have here is a Peroni hive. What the government has um, taught us so far is that we actually have two different versions of hive that we're learning about right now. It's the Langstroth hive. It's a basic box and you put frames in it. But with the Peroni hive, what we did is we scotched it because you know, a lot of times trees, once they get hit by lightning, they create that hole. So that's what this hive is supposed to be. supposed to give that tree like mentality and we burn the edges so it, it has that burnt smell. All right, and with the Langstroth hive, you don't have to fool with it. You have to fool with it more frequently. But with the Peroni hive, because you want to keep it as natural as possible, you, you tend not to really bother with it. These young people are now in business and are on Alpha's farm to do an extraction and also to set up a colony to help Alpha pollinate his farm and produce his own honey. Honey from beekeeping is one of the most lucrative agricultural products. Okay, my name is Tenille Capron. We came out here on the farm to do some extractions. He actually has five hives on site that we know about. There was a massive hive he had inside the house deep in the bush. It was about 20 layers thick. And what we did was we took the hive down, we did an extraction, we split them into two hives because they actually had more than one queen within that hive. So we took it, we split it, and we put them in line straw hive boxes. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep an eye on them, make sure that they are growing. Once we see that they're doing well, we're going to move them from here and put it into one of the locations that the government gave to us. And then we're going to just watch them and develop them and ensure that they continue to populate. All right, what we're going to do right now, we just want to check on this hive to see how it's set up, what's really going on with it, so we know when we come back tomorrow how we're going to go about extracting it. And when we extract it, what we do is we put it in a, in a box, a bee box, like we showed you earlier, you did a Peroni or the Langstroth hive, and then we put it in a proper area where it's away from humans, so no one gets stung, and then we grow the hive and grow honey, honey to sell. Capron and her colleagues are not exterminators. They think of themselves as moving people for an insect that is critical to our farming industry. Without bees, most farms will fail, and the price that honey can fetch per ounce makes handling them a worthy investment. But they're interested in more than just moving the bees. They want to eventually package their own honey. Yeah, me, DJ. They in in the bus. They ain't like on the inside. They in the structure of the bus. Capron says that's their part in helping to feed the Bahamas. I feel like if we get this bee program up and running and it yeah. succeeds, we don't, we, it's a lot of things that we won't have to import. We'll literally become the exporters rather than the importers. And I feel like this program is a good start to get that get us to that point. Grand Bahama is often described as several islands within one island. The urban freeport and Eight Mile Rock, and then to the far east and far west, a more family island experience. In West Grand Bahama, West End in particular, fishing is the business. Every day, hundreds of fishermen cast off in small boats, hoping to dive enough conch or catch enough fish to supply the local fish houses in West End and in Freeport with fresh fish, lobster, and conch. Okay, okay. It's a good living. Grand Bahamas fishing grounds are some of the most fertile in the country, and the quality of Grand Bahama seafood is legendary. But abuse is common especially when it comes to harvesting undersized conch. One, one of the conch that I saw um, had a, had a, was an undersized or a juvenile conch. And uh, uh, because of that, I simply spoke to him because there was only one conch I saw like that. I just notified him again about, you know, the difference between adult conch and juvenile. And I showed him the thickness of the lip on the conch and I told him that is how we determine how, how what the what the 
whether it's an adult or a juvenile. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out to them, so, you know, a lot of our job has to do with education. So we will also talk to him. And, you know, since there was only one conch I looked at, you know, I just spoke to him about it. So I would assume in future he would not bring in conch like that if he were to see it underwater. Preserving the stock is important to seafood processors like Kirk Neely of Boardwalk Seafood in West End. Boardwalk is one of the country's leading exporters of stone crabs. So what we're gonna do now is just take it and put it into this box, weigh it to show us the right way, and then we'll box it and strap it. Every day during stone crab season, Neely and his staff of 13 prepare freshly caught stone crabs for export to states along the eastern coast of the United States. It's been a very profitable product so far. The success with stone crab and lobster exports isn't just limited to boardwalk. Now this is our processing room. Um, all our processing is being done here. Um, the, the staff enters this door and before they do anything, they have to wash and sanitize their hands. Mm -hmm. Set their foot bath, wash, sanitize their hands, put their aprons on, sanitize the entire the tables, the bin, the knives and everything before start the processing, which starts over here. This is the first station. Mm -hmm. All the deveining and the deveining mainly is being done here. The water is being ten tested here for temperature. And then you come over here for the second step or the second processing, which is the, the grading of different sizes. Lynette Lewis and Paul Baldwin make up the team that run the day-to-day -day operations at G&L Seafoods. We export more lobster, conch, and stone crab. And we export, in the past, we did, we exported to China, France, United States, and Canada. Mm, okay. Germany, Germany also. For Neely, it was not easy getting into the business. After you experience it, and it was a expensive experience for me, especially the stones. After you go through all of that, you appreciate the business. You understand as long as you're doing it the right way, it's a very, 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 very good business to be in. Um, I encourage a lot of people to go out there and, and, and get into the seafood business. And, and mind you, even though the processors look like they make money, the fishermen who really make the money out there, you know. So people out there that don't, you know, want, want, want to go abroad or whatever it may be, listen, get into fishing. Fishing is a very good industry. Um, we pay some fishermen twice a week, three, four thousand dollars, and it's just them and, and, and a partner or them and the son, they do the diving, they come in and out. You can't make that kind of living nowhere else in the world. This is a very good industry. The passage of hurricanes Matthew and Irma had an unexpected side effect for processors like Neely. The hurricanes disrupted the Florida crabbing grounds and opened up the market to Grand Bahama exporters. My experience has, told, has taught us to diversify. We started out just lobster, didn't want to do anything else but lobster. Uh, and now we export fish, conch, crab and lobster. Um, because you'll find out as you go in the business, you're sitting there just doing one product. When the season closes, you're done. So, you know, you have to find a way to keep the business going, to keep people employed, to keep money coming in, and then you realize, oh shoot, so I better do conk, or I better do crab, or I better do all one, you know. And so that's where we are now. We're pretty, 
happened here, I believe what's going on. Neely started with a business model that included his own fleet of crab boats so that he'd be able to keep his supply constant. He still buys from other fishermen, but he knows that if, for whatever reason, those boats come back empty, he has his own crew to rely on. It's a model that's made Boardwalk one of the most reliable suppliers of stone crab to the U.S. The success, however, has him wary about fishermen who may be tempted to practice unsustainable habits or overfish the species. Crab has sort of taken off in the Bahamas and everyone's doing it, but there are some things that we need to practice and understand, uh, and the safe procurement and the sustainability of it. Um, the industry standards is one biter. The crab regenerates the biter. Uh, it's very unfortunate that we have people that would break both biters because then you need the crab defenseless, can't eat, blah, blah, blah. So for my guys, to the best of my ability, I always stress, listen, one biter. I'm certain that the fishermen may want to do that, but we don't have a problem when it comes to the sizes because we demand that of most of our product or, or the stone crabs be the larger ones. We warn them up front that if they do come, we're, we're obligated to, in order to sustain our license and, and uh, survival, uh, to report it to the Ministry of Fisheries. And they know after so many years that we're not playing with that anymore. We will report them. So we're at a very, very, very minimum uh, intake of under measures, very, very minimum. And the under measures are not really No, they're just, the yeah, under measures are just to the brink on the measurement. And those are the ones, and when we spot them, we, because of course all of our bags that we intake are tagged and we know who, who brought that stock. So when we process, we know whose stock we're processing so we can pick up the phone and I can call that person and say, I need to see you. We're doing your batch today. The boss lady's got a problem. And there it is. And then they, they have to deal with it. Other than that, three years from now, we won't have crops to harvest. We won't have crops to, to the industry will die. This is why Neely preaches a responsible catch and handling gospel to anyone he does business with. Okay, these are frozen gel packs. What we do is we put them in the crab because the crab is not frozen. These are all fresh. So the gel packs keep them at a temperature below 42 degrees for shipping. And we put three or four of them, keeps it at a cool temperature for the rest of the flight. And now it's not. Neely has been able to create some employment in the West Grand Bahama area, albeit seasonal. He says he's still building out his concept, where boardwalk success can convert those part-time jobs into full-time opportunities. The topic of poaching, out-of-season harvesting, and harvesting of undersized species is a sore point for the processors. Paul Baldwin offers this radical solution. Poaching is a problem, but I think poaching by Bahamians is our biggest problem in the off season. I personally think that at the end of April, the government of the Bahamas, the ministry should say, no more lobster in a restaurant to be sold. This is one way that I think sustains our, our survivalist uh, survivability because we won't have people selling lobster in the off season and little ones or big ones. There will be no demand, my opinion. At this time in Grand Bahama, my, my heart goes out to so many residents that are pursuing employment. The good news is many of you that are watching have an opportunity to immediately, immediately generate income by entering into agricultural production. You also have an opportunity through fisheries to generate a tremendous amount of employment. I mean, 
uh, quite candidly, fish is dying of old age in Bahamian waters in, in many respects. And so I would say to many of the young men and women, you have a wonderful opportunity to generate income, to generate employment uh, by entering this exciting arena. Whether it is going on a vessel or whether it is working in a fish processing or marine product processing plant, there are opportunities that exist. By all accounts, the Grand Bahama seafood industry is strong and growing. The owners understand that in order to maintain their growth, taking care of the people who make up the industry is important. We, we pay our fishermen on average about $20 across the board, which is good compared to $12, 12 to $14 in previous years. Um, once again, that's a good thing. This, you know, it harmed the business in, the key, in key West, but for us it was a good thing. But if we abuse it, we won't have that opportunity again. The question of can we feed ourselves appears less complicated when you look at the Grand Bahama farming and fishing community. The island's diversity of farming focuses and its well-developed marine products business suggests that Grand Bahama is closer to that goal than most would think. Stakeholders say they still need that extra push from the government and they should be fine. But it will take more than just that. Grand Bahama's employment situation could quickly turn around if more young people seize on the ownership possibilities that exist in farming and fishing. But more importantly, if the will to do so matches the tools it has, Grand Bahama can definitely feed itself.